Hi, welcome class. It's my first uh, time trying this, so um, take it easy on the criticism. They will improve. Anyway, um, so this is chapter 24, Ireland and the European Union. And um, you can get this from my website, mrmcgarry.weebly.com under LC Resources. Uh, you'll see it there under CH24 EXP. Okay, so Ireland, the European Union. Well, at the moment, bang up to date, as you know, we have the, the virus. And at the moment, people are giving out a bit that the EU, the EU haven't been working properly together to try and help certain countries like Italy, where the pandemic hit uh, particularly bad heights compared to other countries. So a lot of people criticizing that you, the European Union should have one single strategy to deal with it and that all countries should follow. I know people are worried that it might uh, break apart because as this virus kicks in, people are thinking more on an individual basis and looking after their own citizens, et cetera, et cetera. So the EU is basically a group of countries that are joined together. Um, Ireland was a member very early on and we hold quite a bit of sway in, in Europe as a result. We've had presidencies over the year. And what the European Union does is it, um, it's a base, basically a collection of countries uh, that work together for common trade to make business and doing trade between each country a lot easier. So there's a lot less red tape. Um, some laws uh, overlap. Obviously, if you were working on your own for things like climate change, you wouldn't be able to solve that problem on your own. So the idea behind unions, whether it be the EU or say, NATO or the United Nations is for countries to join together with a common purpose and work towards things that they can help each other with, uh, such as climate change. If we have a common plan for climate change and we have certain targets set by the European Union that we all have to reach and then we get fined if we don't reach them. Obviously that works well for, uh, for a, a type of situation where you, where you have more than just one country working on its own. So from that perspective, the European Union is good. Uh, I suppose the downside is people don't always work together and people often have their own interests at heart. And some people argue that because Germany is maybe the biggest power in Europe with the biggest population and arguably the biggest economy, some people argue that countries like Germany and France perhaps have too much power. Um, but anyway, so you're often asked a question leave and start to evaluate the European Union. So it's good to give your opinions on it. Anyway, so Ireland, the European Union, uh, and it's from the Business Express uh, slideshows. Okay, so first off, they show you a company about uh, called Kingspan. And Kingspan is a great Irish company. And just to know it's a PLC, so it's a public limited company, uh, which means it does a lot of business around Europe um, and around the world. Um, and has its base in Ireland, and it's a building materials company. Uh, so it's involved a lot in, in building materials. Okay, so what's the European Union? So the European Union is an international trading bloc and political alliance of European nations designed to promote closer political, economic, and social cooperation uh, among its members. So politically, the ministers will meet up. Say, for example, the finance ministers might meet up from each EU country and they might decide uh, ways to tackle banking, for example. And then uh, economically, they might uh, meet up together again, it might be the finance minister, because that'll be their speciality. Depending on what minister, it might be the minister for the environment, they might meet up and decide on plans for the environment. Socially, uh, ministers will meet up. Um, sometimes the Taoiseachs, in other words, the, uh, the leaders, and not always called Taoiseachs, so the leaders of each individual European country will join together and decide uh, what way to go forward for the European Union. Okay, so each member country contributes tax revenue towards the cost of run the EU, and in return shares economic and political policies intended to benefit all its members. Okay, so each uh, country gives, gives tax. We have to give tax towards Europe, because into a fund of Europe. Of course, you have accountants in Europe, you have finance people in Europe, you have loads of people working for the EU. You have different parliaments, and you have different councils, and you have different bodies within the EU, and they all cost a lot of money to, to, to run. Um, in return, we get um, 
you know, ideas from different EU countries. Um, we get some economic uh, benefits, for example, sometimes they give us funding for building new roads, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so if you have any questions, make sure you email them to john.mcgarry at stjosephsrush.com. Um, also, I'll be putting this into an ed puzzle. So what I'll try to do is after a number of slides, I'll put a question in and see if you can answer it and then you respond and it'll be up on a, on a file down at Postal on who completed what and how much of the video you watched and, and how many questions you answered and all that's kept then on file within Ed Puzzle. Okay, so chapter 24, Ireland and the European Union. So how are EU policies and laws made? So it starts with the EU Commission, which is like a civil service. You know, in Ireland, we've got a civil service, which is basically the people who run the country administratively. So there are people who work in offices around, around Dublin and Ireland, working for the Department of Education, Finance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, but you also have one in Europe to look after um, the administrative side of Europe, okay? Then you've got uh, the Council of Europe, and that re represents national governments and has uh, more, even more power again. And the EU Parliament then represents EU um, citizens. So you get a lot of people elected to Parliament, so they're called the MEPs. You'll see them up in posters in Ireland, so we send a certain amount of MEPs or members of the European Parliament to this EU Parliament, and they'll speak on our behalf, yeah? Okay. How are new EU laws introduced? Um, well, first of all, the EU Commission uh, proposes a new law, so uh, say, for example, we're gonna bring a, in a new law to to increase or reduce carbon emissions by 10% um, instead of the current 7%. So that could be proposed as a new law by, by anyone, uh, it could be any country. And then uh, the EU Commission uh, consults with the EU Parliament and interest groups. So it'll talk then with the people in the EU, EU Parliament, the MEPs, the members of the European Parliament. And in, interest groups just means big organizations like farmers groups or climate activist groups uh, etc. Yeah, number three then, EU Commission redrafts proposed new law, so what that means is they redo it, so it'll start with the Commission, then they'll discuss with Parliament, and then the EU Commission will redo it, so they'll have a look at it again, and maybe edit a few bits, and then put it into maybe better language, and maybe a few extra points, or take away some points, and then, it, and then they propose a new law. If they're happy then, uh, both sides are happy there, what will happen then is it'll go to the EU Council, which is a, 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 an even more powerful organisation, and the EU Council then can approve a new law. Okay, so after that then, the EU Commission and national governments implement those laws uh, within Europe and then within uh, the national, just means the Irish government is the, the Irish national government, you have the French national government. So within national governments then they'll have to uh, also implement them in, in the individual countries. Okay, so that's an example of, in your book, a case study about motor uh, Harley-Davidson cycles. And yeah, it's good to read the case studies. They're not your priority. Your priority, as I was saying, on Schoology is to um, concentrate on units two, three, and four of your exam papers because they're the units that are going to come up in the Leave and Start exam. And of course, any case study and any business documentary or news item that you read is adding to your overall knowledge of business and you need to be able to express, express opinions in business. So the more you know about business, the better your exam is going to go to. Okay, so you can read that case study in the book on Harley Davis. So what is the role of special interest groups in the EU decision-making body? So we've, we said special interest groups are people like, say, the Farms Association, maybe climate activists, maybe uh, those type of groups will go into ministers and commissioners and members of the European Parliament and try and lobby. And that means they'll talk to them and they'll negotiate with them and they'll try and get uh, something better, say, for the climate, for the climate activists, something better for the farmers, for the, the Irish Farmers Association, for example, or the... Yeah. And then setting up uh, offices in Brussels and Strasbourg. So what they do is a lot of those interest groups set up special offices. So the climate activist group might have an office in Brussels. So they can have people knocking on uh, the door of the ministers and the commissioners and MEPs constantly to try and get their way. They also, these interest groups also use PR, that's public relations. In other words, they'll 
get into the newspapers and the social media to try and push fav favor for their particular uh, ideas and, and, and laws they might want to try and get these people to introduce for them. Um, they also organise protests and public demonstrations, um, again, to try and highlight issues and then get uh, the likes of commissioners, ministers and members of the European Parliament to negotiate, talk about them, maybe bring in things that are going to help uh, the different interest groups. Okay, so next slide. So what are the main EU policies? Um, you've got a, a single European market, which means some of that's shortened down to S SEM. Um, uh, and that can be an abbreviation in one of your questions, short questions in the exam. But um, it means that you have a single market, which means you can uh, trade and do business a lot easier with, say, uh, Germany than you could do with, say, China, because China aren't part of the, the European Union. So in other words, if you were exporting to China, there'd be loads of red tape, loads of documentation, loads of um, issues with uh, importing, exporting, um, changing laws, et cetera, et cetera, which makes business uh, a lot more difficult. Um, different language, of course, as well. Um, in Europe, um, there's a lot, all that red tape is broken down, and they, what they want to do is encourage different countries within Europe to trade and do business very easily with each other. So we can buy and sell stuff uh, from the EU uh, with ease. Okay, so the European Monetary Union. So. To facilitate that, what, what they did was they brought in a thing called the euro, um, which is our currency. Um, so obviously, if you've got the same currency in the past, you had the franc, for example, in France, and you had the Deutsche Mark in Germany, so they're all different currencies. So that made it complicated. You had to work out the maths on it, see the exchange rates, see how much money you were, you were winning or losing after, doing, after exporting or in, importing. Now it's a lot easier. You have the euro, so everyone can see the prices clearly, and buying selling and selling becomes uh, a lot easier for everyone. So it's part of this whole EU uh, idea, yeah? Social policy, so social policy means how do we make uh, Europe a better place for its citizens? Uh, how do we make the standard of living better for everyone? Okay. The common agricultural policy, well, how do we maximize and get the best out of our farmers um, so that we're all working together and we're not all producing the exact same thing? Because there's no point um, all the farmers uh, say in in the whole of europe all doing dairy for example and then you have no uh, agricultural vegetables and what have you so what they'll do is they'll say right you're a good country for producing that you should focus on that this country should focus on that and others they try and play to each other's strengths and so that they can sell and buy from each other again and uh, the environmental policy as i was saying it's currently at seven percent uh, the carbon emissions they want uh, the 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 idea is that to keep emissions below 7% um, and uh, currently the, the, the Green Party are talking about getting into a coalition government with Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael and they're looking for targets to be set for, 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 for CO2 emissions. In other words, emissions from fossil fuels, coal, oil, etc. Okay, so structural policies then. So in other words, if... Europe has often helped us with uh, building roads and bridges and um, different uh, business types and building types and ICT plants, etc., to be able to um, make jobs, make money, um, and modernize Ireland. And not just Ireland, but uh, they'll invest in new entrants into the EU as well and try and build them up um, structurally as well. And then competition policies, so um, they also bring in um, anti-competitive laws within Europe to make it possible to compete. So, for example, Lidl was allowed to come into Ireland, even though it's a German store, and you know their own Irish stores would be super value, and done stores. But uh, now that we're part of Europe, it allows uh, stores such as Lidl, a German store, to come in and compete directly with the Irish supermarkets. And of course, the same for Irish shops and retailers who want to um, sell in Europe, um, they're allowed to do that. And the big advantage to Ireland there is we're only a small population of about 3.7 million, including Northern Ireland, maybe around 5 million. So that's not a lot of customers um, if you're a big company like Kerry Group or Kingspan. So they'll want to expand and they'll want to sell, buy and sell products across Europe because Europe would have a population of maybe around four or 500 million. 
So you can see how many customers you could have as a company and how cool that would be for you if you were a PLC um, wanting to buy and sell products abroad. Yeah. Okay, so competition policies will be there to try and allow healthy competition um, between companies within the EU. Okay, so what are the benefits of EU membership to Ireland? Um, well, one of the benefits is we've had access to a large and wealthy market, as I spoke of, about 500 people in Europe. Less bureaucracy, which means less red tape. In other words, easier to import and export. Um, membership of the Eurozone, access to business and agricultural grants. Yeah, we often get grants for agriculture. In fact, some of our farmers get grants for growing trees on their land to help with uh, climate change as well. Yeah. Um, but there'll be all sorts of grants for businesses and to our maybe Enterprise Ireland will get some grants to set up certain businesses that they think will be good uh, going into the future. Of course, there's talk of the economy changing completely into a more sustainable economy after uh, the new government gets in, gets, gets in, gets in place in Ireland. Um, some people believe that the current economic model is more medium term and maybe isn't uh, set up in a way that would be good for long term. For example, a lot of companies rely on, um, on oil and fossil fuels, um, which are finite, in other words, they'll run out eventually. Um, and also the impact of farming on nature and soils, and people think that's not gonna be able to um, just continue. So what they're talking about now is a new economic model, more renewable energy, more, more care for the environment, more quality of life for people. It's not just people uh, rushing around um, in very busy jobs and not having enough time for, for, or for a better quality of life. Okay, so um, I'm on the point there for employees. So for employees, jobs in, export, in sporting firms include uh, transnational companies who set up European operations in Ireland. So the benefit of being in the EU for Ireland is we've the likes of Google and Microsoft and Intel and loads of different big multinational companies companies or you can call them global companies transnational companies and they set up some of our headquarters in ireland um, because we're a key member of the eu um, because we speak english because of our educated workforce because of our low 12.5 percent tax rate but also again because we're part of the european union and obviously that makes it easier for, for those businesses then to do businesses within the european union Okay, so for consumers, the use of a common currency, increased consumer choice, and strong consumer legislation. And so what they're saying there is the EU membership to Ireland is good for consumers, in other words, you and I that go and buy stuff, um, because we get to use the same currency, say we're going online and buying stuff from Poland, we can see exactly what price it is and buy it easily. Um, increased consumer choice, we get to have loads of different choice, from, you can buy from any country in Europe online. Um, and we get an awful lot more products coming in because obviously if it was only um, Ireland, we wouldn't be able to get a lot of the brand names that are made in different parts of Europe. We'd only have Irish brands if we weren't open to um, allowing imports in. And that'll be known by the way as a protectionist economy. And China went through that for, for a long time where they just didn't allow uh, many exports at all. They were very strict on what they allowed into their country. They're still quite strict, but um, at one point, they were very strict. So a lot of their, their, the, the things they consumed were built and made by, by Chinese people. Uh, so it depends what economic model you go after. Okay, so for the economy, investment in infrastructure. Again, when you think of infrastructure, think of buildings, think of bridges, think of roads, the things that uh, are set up to, to facilitate business uh, um, do, doing, their, doing their stuff. So investment in infrastructure, more responsible economic policies. Um, so the benefits of EU membership is um, more, more responsible economic policies. In other words, in Ireland for, for a long time, we just used to spend, spend, spend. Um, some would argue that we still do that, but now we have Europe looking over our shoulder and saying, well, hold on a minute. You're letting house prices get out of control. You're spending too much. You're not taking enough tax on the fossil fuel industries blah, blah, blah. Um, so that, that's been good for the country and that it keeps an eye on what our politicians are doing and helps bring them in line for what's better for Europe and, Europe and the world, arguably. Again, everything can be argued in life, uh, same with this. So stronger environmental uh, protection. So 
Um, that's true. You couldn't do that on your own. Um, you need um, people to be working together globally, never mind even just in the European Union. So that's where the U United Nations would come in as well, uh, because that's countries working together, uh, united around the world. Not every single country, but most countries in the world. Okay, so Microsoft, I've given you a case study and a documentary on Microsoft. It's up online and it's also up on Schoology. Um, so obviously an important co company, good to know about it. Do you need to know about every global company? No, I was saying maybe focus on a few. So Amazon being the biggest in the world uh, would be an important company to know about. Google, given its big operations in Ireland, or you could use Microsoft, very big companies and important companies for Ireland. Um, I think it's good to know about uh, uh, one or two of them. And then you need to pick an Irish uh, owned and run company. And you need to remember Ryanair and, and Michael O'Leary um, being one of the best managers for reducing costs on a, on a company and, and, and building that company to be one of the, the best run uh, managed companies probably in the world. Uh, yeah, okay. So what challenges face Ireland and the EU in the future? So there's a few issues that face Ireland and we need to increase uh, more exports to the European Union. Um, we need to obey EU rules on economic management. So what does that mean? That means you need to, we need to obey uh, rules that we saw. Rules are, 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 are built into the, in, into the EU and they pass different phases and then it becomes a law. And then we have to follow those laws. And we need to increase exports to EU. That just means obviously we need to sell more. The more we sell uh, from Ireland into other places, the more money our country makes as a whole. So that, that's, uh, that's obvious. So increase competition from other uh, EU countries for transnational investment. Okay, so the challenges are uh, here are that we're getting a lot more companies coming in from the EU um, competing against our own companies. So obviously, if our countries our companies aren't up to that, um, their companies could take over and ours will, will, will be at a loss. Um, the other challenges there, yeah, need to obey. So in other words, they're saying it's hard to obey the, the EU rules. And then they're also another challenge is to increase exports to the EU. But it's not easy to export sometimes in terms of you need a lot of money, you need a lot of uh, know-how, et cetera. And maybe you need to know something about foreign languages as well and on where you're, you're, you're exporting in Europe. So there are other challenges uh, facing Ireland. Now, issues facing the entire European Union. So what are the problems that the, the EU is going to face? Well, trying to protect its euro currency because some countries... Uh, Take, for example, Britain wanted to take back their own currency and have sterling. Now they're back to sterling. They've uh, done something called Brexit, which means that they've broken away from the European Union and they're now controlling their, their currency, controlling their own laws, etc., etc., business and the whole lot. And they're negotiating a new deal with Europe to try and get business uh, working for them across Europe as well. Okay, tar another problem for Europe is tax harmonization. Uh, an example there is we have a, a tax for corporate companies, which I've said many times in class, of 12.5%. Um, a lot of countries give out about that in, in, in Central Europe in particular, saying that we shouldn't be uh, given the likes of Google and Microsoft, etc., a such cheap tax rate, uh, given the amount of money they make. Yeah? And we were even known as, uh, as charging even less tax, 1% at one stage, just to keep them in Ireland. Okay, and then reform of EU decision-making bodies, and that's another problem facing the European Union, that it's hard to reform uh, the different organisations that make up the EU, like the Parliament, the Council, etc. And you know, disagreements uh, between different countries, different cultures, etc., etc. So that's all problematic. Um, reform of EU budgets, especially the common uh, agricultural policy. So that's, uh, let me see, reform of EU budgets. Basically, are saying that's a problem for uh, Europe because obviously uh, individual countries like to set their own taxes. They like to reform. They like to make their own national budgets. They don't want interference from anyone else saying this is what you can spend, this is what you, you shouldn't spend, this is what you should tax, this is what you shouldn't tax. Um, so that causes problems when 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 Europe tries to maybe interfere with with, with budgets, individual budgets, like the Irish national budget. Right. Okay. Moving on. So. Oh yeah, now exam practice, fine. Okay, so that's it. So um, yeah, so in summary, what you'd want to do, you often get a question on evaluate uh, uh, Ireland's membership of the, of the European Union. So you need to know, for example, um, 
what are the pros, what are the cons of being in, in, in Europe, um, and what's your own opinion on it, and where do you think it's, it's going into the future? Is it going to last? Is it a good idea for Ireland? Is it a bad idea for Ireland? Is it a good idea for Europe? Um, yeah. So again, if you have any questions, email john.mcgarry at joelstrush.com. And uh, thanks for watching. And hopefully the next one will be an improvement on this one. That's the plan anyway. So, okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Morning, class. Uh, today I'm going to take you through um, the last chapter in the Leaving Certificate Business uh, course on Unit 7, and that's Chapter 25. Remember to uh, not study these chapters in isolation because Unit 7 should be seen as a whole, as they link together. As you see when you go to the exam papers, you'll see that the questions are divided into different sections by units. So it's important to, to link chapters together and to think of business as a whole. Okay, so keep that in mind when we're doing this chapter. It, it links very well into chapter 23 as well, okay, in particular. As you know, it's all about global business and international trade in chapter 23. And in chapter 24, we were talking about EU, and we are talking about how the EU is a good organization for helping trade and breaking down red tape within, within the European Union. Yeah, so this goes further now and talks about business, not just within the EU, but on a global scale, in other words, internationally and around the world, okay? Right, so, um, first slide then. So you'll see that this is a, uh, an activity to do in your book, and you can do it in your book, um, on Business Express, if that's the book you have. And chapter 25, um, Global Business is going to be a few pages in. So they talk about a company called Unilever. And the reason they talk about a company called Unilever is because Unilever is one of the biggest companies in the world. And it owns a lot of brand names that we'd be very familiar with. So if you look at the pictures, you see Hellman's Mayonnaise, Knorr, Purcell, uh, Link Spray, Calippo, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They're all their brands, in other words, they own them. They're a global business, so they operate in many different countries around the world, and they sell those products in many different countries around the world. Okay, so what are uh, transnational corporations? Okay, so transnational corporations are firms that produce and market goods in more than one country. So it's good to learn off particular definitions. That'll be a good definition to learn off. Um, yeah, so it produce and market goods in more than one country. So that means they make the goods in more than one country and the market means they sell them um, in, in, in more than one country as well. So if you think of probably one of the biggest com companies in the world, and we, we've done it as a case study, and we've sent you on video links and documentation on Amazon.com. And the reason we did that is because they're literally the biggest company in the world at the moment, um, if not one of the biggest at least. Their market capitalization is, is huge. It's like in the, the billions uh, of billions. We could be talking nearly a trillion at this stage. Um, McDonald's as well. Um, is a huge company as we know. We'd all be very familiar with, with a lot of the companies here. Adidas, for example. Um, the ones we're focusing in the class are Amazon and Ryanair. For, so that we have a, an Irish company, a successful Irish company, um, Airline. Um, but I mean, if you, if you wanted to look up uh, extra information on Adidas, might be a nice one to do it on too there as well. Um, that's a big German company. Yeah, and we'd all know it from, 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 from wearing it, from people who, who wear that brand, that brand for football and sponsorship of the big football teams, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so they're all huge, big transnational corporations, massive big companies, okay? So moving on. What are the reasons for the development of global companies and uh, home market saturation, no more growth? So what they're saying there is the reason for the development of these companies, why they're becoming bigger and bigger, is because in their own markets, so in Ireland, for example, Kerry Group would be a huge company it wouldn't be so big if it only operated in Ireland. So they get to a point where they have maximized their sales in Ireland, the population as a whole, approximately around 5 million, including Northern Ireland. And they want to expand. And the way they expand is to export and get bigger and operate in different countries. So the reason for global companies is that they want to expand, you know, they're public, they become public limited companies and then expand into different areas. Now, spread the business risk between different countries. Yeah. So the other reason why they, why they want to go global is because if their own country isn't performing well, their economy, in other words, um, isn't 
performing well, which means all their businesses and their products and services and the amount of money that that country is making is maybe not doing so well, but maybe it is in, in another country. So uh, that will give you a portfolio of, of, of different levels of risk, which is good. So if one country is doing well, you might be selling loads, say in Ireland, um, whereas in, say, the Congo or something, you might be selling very little. Depends where you're operating. Yeah, you might want to uh, sell into the Congo because maybe there's not a market for your product there. Uh, so that that's all from market research and uh, your experts in marketing and your marketing team to find out where to sell and where, where you're going to make the most profit. Okay, so uh, achieve economies of scale. We touch on that in class a lot. Um, economies of scale talks about the bigger the company becomes, the cheaper it becomes to produce things, and also. Um, the more you, you produce in bulk, the better value you get, and also then the cheaper prices uh, that you're going to be able to sell to, to, to customers. Because if you're getting economies of scale, everything's getting bigger. So um, the products per item are getting cheaper to produce. Um, yeah, and then you're so good and so experienced at selling stuff that your prices uh, can reflect those economies in other words those uh those advantages that you have over a small company so you can uh maybe compete at a way higher level than a small company because you could force them out of the market by by reducing your costs and then pricing your products a lot cheaper your service it could be as well a lot cheaper and the other smaller companies can't compete okay so avail of new global markets and opportunities um, so that's the other develop, reason for the development of global companies that they, they want to uh, enter into new uh, markets and new opportunities to make money basically for, 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 for big companies into different countries. Faster transport and communications makes international trade easier. Okay, so now that we have uh, huge airlines industries around the world, um, able to get people from A to B very quickly for say, um, meetings or if a manager needs to go and, and check out an operation see how it's working meet the staff blah 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 and even easier again and during this crisis obviously it's uh communications are made very easy with with the likes of uh what i'm using here zoom and and, and people are using that a lot for for meetings at the moment um along with a lot of different online uh, platforms um some companies uh, huge companies have massive big platforms run by say oracle and different massive companies, Microsoft will set them up so that they can do their communications mostly online. So obviously that's way cheaper than getting a flight um, and a lot quicker and easier to get in contact with people. Uh, I suppose the, the disadvantages are that you're not getting that face-to-face -face contact with, with, with your customers and with your employees, etc. Okay, so uh, e-business makes selling global globally easier. Well, prime example for that is Amazon. Look at it, it during this crisis, it's actually perform, outperforming every other com company again. It's, it's, it's actually suiting it, if anything, this crisis because people are sitting at home and they're buying lots and lots online. So e-business means electronic business. That means buying and selling online. Um, e-business makes selling globally easier. So the fact that Amazon can reach countries in every country around the world, miles and miles apart, and easily sell to them. They've got distribution chains set up. They've got the direct link to a customer. So you and I in Ireland, but also uh, him and her, say in Australia or New Zealand or China or whatever it might be. So um, e-business is obviously uh, a lot easier nowadays than, than it used to be when we didn't have the internet, et cetera, called marketing. And what we looked at uh, within that section and that unit was a marketing mix. And we said another word for marketing mix was the four P's of marketing. And we should know off by heart that the four P's of marketing are product, price, place, promotion. Um, there's more when marketing becomes more complicated, but that's all you need to know for example. For example, you could add, add in packaging. Um, you could add in people. Uh, some companies do. But anyway, for the leaving cert, uh, it, it, it limits it to, to, to four is all you need. But when it comes to global marketing mix, uh, what you need to know is that the product, price, place, promotion all uh, often have to get adapted or customized, in other words, which means changed to suit the local needs of local foreign markets. Now, companies operate this in different ways. So uh, some will use a, a standardized marketing mix, which means they don't do an awful lot of adjustments to their brand from one country to the next. 
and in other com companies, because of the nature of their product or service, they have to change an awful lot. Um, think about it. If you're selling into, say, Israel, you're gonna, you might have to, because they have a good standard of English, you might have to change into uh, different languages. You might, the symbols that you use, the colors that you use, might represent different ideas in their heads than it would in our heads. Same if you were to sell um, into China, um, you're going to be using a lot of different symbols, complicated symbols, and you need expertise in that area. So your global marketing mix is going to have to be adjusted to the Chinese uh, culture, to its country, to its language, to the way it does business differently to us, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and Ford here then is just Ford uh, global marketing mix. They do a, a case study in the, in the book about Ford and how they adjust their marketing mix to suit uh, the international global market. Okay, so what is the global marketing mix? So we've talked about uh, product, price, place, and promotion already. Okay, so global marketing means marketing or selling and finding out the needs and wants of your consumers and then selling them, selling into that need. So it means marketing a product globally, which means internationally, would broadly the same marketing mix as, as though the world were a single marketplace. Okay, so what they're saying there is, um, marketing your product as if uh, the world were like uh, very similar, homogenous in the world for similar, and you're, you're not a, adjusting an awful lot of what you do. Where some companies, as we said, this word here, adapt, they adapt each of the elements of the marketing mix to suit the needs of the local foreign markets. Okay, so take McDonald's, for example. McDonald's has a brand that they don't change the symbol, it's still a yellow M around the world, which you can find easily. So you're walking down a road, no matter what country you come in, that brand name is gonna be almost identical uh, everywhere in the world. Um, more or less the same with a can of Coca-Cola. Uh, but if you get a, a Big Mac, for example, in France, they'll have adjusted a tiny bit in taste. They'll have added things to the menu that we wouldn't necessarily have here in Ireland. Um, and they might run different types of food promotions at different times than would in Ireland. So it's just, just be aware of that, that the, you might have a standardized uh, marketing mix and you might do minor adjustments within that to suit the local uh, needs of the market too. So global pricing then depends on the local market. So you need to look at your pricing globally, what you charge to your Irish customers might not be the same as what you're gonna to charge to some of your customers in Africa. Obviously the standard of living, the amount of wages that we get uh, are completely different um, in a lot of countries in Africa compared to Ireland. So you're gonna to have to change your pricing to, to, to meet those, those needs of the local market. Global place then, um, that's looking at how you're going to actually distribute, how you're going to get your products from A to B within these global markets. So how are you going to get your products uh, globally distributed? Are you going to use agents? Are you going to use uh, licensing? Are you going to use joint ventures? That's basically getting involved with another company to help you sell in that local market. Are you going to, you're going to use foreign subsidiaries? So that's basically an office. Say in China, you might employ uh, a mixture of maybe you invite people to come from Ireland if you're an Irish company you want to go global. You invite maybe a manager from Ireland to go over and oversee, but you also need maybe a Chinese manager working hand in hand. And then you're employing Chinese staff. So you have a number of different variables there. You might also invite some Irish staff over from Ireland. So that's a, a, a you know, that can be, it can be, um, it can be worthwhile and it can also be complicated to set up. So your distribution and how you sell and how you get your, your products to the market, um, you need to consider that as a business person. Are you gonna go uh, distribute globally directly? That'd be like some Amazon online. Obviously they adjust their language, et cetera. Uh, when, they, when you see an Amazon screen, for, for example, in say Russia or China, it's gonna look differently to the, the Amazon uh, screen that we get to, in, in, in the Western world. Yeah? So, uh, or in particularly in English speaking countries. Okay, so um, the brand's gonna be the same, but just it, the language obviously is gonna to have to, you can adjust whatever language that you want that suits the local needs. Um, but if you're not Amazon and you're a company that needs to go out and, and uh, meet people, uh, maybe you're in building, you need to go and check some building sites out, see what way you're gonna do it, blah, blah, blah. You're gonna to have to have a local office and you're gonna to have to have something like a foreign office uh, working for you abroad. Yeah, could be an agent, work in the, in the 
country that you want to, to business in, say, for example, um, wherever it might be, New Zealand or wherever. And global promotion. So obviously this is a, can be a tricky one. For McDonald's, it's not too tricky. Everyone knows that brand and the Coca-Cola colors. The McDonald's colors, they are worldwide. So you can standardize a fair amount of their um, advertising and promotions. Obviously, you have to change language when, when, when uh, you're advertising to different countries, different languages. But you also have to take in the uniqueness of every country around the world. Where every country has its own uniqueness. Every country has its own needs. Every country has its own interpretation and different understanding of different colors, different symbols, different messages. So you're going to have to do market research in that country and decide what, what's the best approach to getting your brand name popular and getting your uh, products to market and getting your products advertised and sold, which is the key thing. So some will use sponsorship. Think of the football jersey I always, I always think for, of, uh, for sponsorship. Uh, you see big companies all the time written on the very front of, say, Manchester United's or Liverpool's jerseys uh, or Barcelona's or whatever it might be. Um, and it's obviously got worldwide appeal then because people can see those soccer games around the world. So you're advertising your brand worldwide. PR, as we said, you can use social media or the news, get positive news stories about your, your, your company and your brand into the, into the media. The media can be your social media, your newspapers, your TV, your billboards, the whole lot. Um, the internet, obviously, there's, ways of diff there's loads of different ways nowadays to promote in various different ways on the internet to attract customers. And then trade fairs is, just say you have a, a company and you want to make it popular in the local, uh, in the country that you want to operate in. Say you're, you're trying to expand into France, for example. You might see what trade fairs are on in Paris, say, in the next uh, few months. Then you bring your product and you bring your people over there. You create a stand in that uh, big building with loads of different companies in it. And what you do is you try and uh, persuade people to take on your product, to buy your product, you create links with your product, maybe to develop distribution chains, to develop alliances, contacts that are going to help you sell that product. Okay. Again, any questions, you email uh Myself, I've handed out my email before, so you know it from the last um, presentation. Okay, Kerry Foods. So a brilliant company, um, um, Kerry Foods. It's one of the biggest in the world, if not the biggest, for the ingredients that you see. So you read the ingredients of most packages of foods. Um, you can be guaranteed nine times out of 10, Kerry Group have got some of their ingredients in that, in that packet of food. So that's something to be proud of. It's a great Irish company. Um, very profitable Irish company, um, and even during the crisis, there's going to, always going to be need for ingredients and food. So, uh, good overall company, and one worth researching. So we've got Ryanair, the airline with Michael O'Leary. Uh, this is another one, a big Irish company. Uh, if you prefer to to do some uh, work on that, we're going to concentrate on is Ryanair and Amazon, or uh, Google. We're saying, if you didn't want to do Amazon. Okay, so moving on. What are the benefits and risks for a business operating globally? Okay, so the benefits then are of, uh, of going global are you've obviously more countries that you can sell to. The more countries you can sell to, the more sales and profits you can potentially earn and make. You've ge you can generate economies of scale because the bigger you get, the easier it, is, easier it is to produce, the cheaper it is to produce, and you get into mass production of items. And it becomes very cheap to uh, to make different items. If you even take the example of Country Crest, an Irish company who produce uh, vegetables, they were recently on Grow, uh, Cook, Eat on RT2 and um, on Wednesday nights, um, an interesting uh, series. But what, what, tying it into this, they are a, a company who said they can't compete uh, by, by only producing a small amount of vegetables that they need to really concentrate on certain types of vegetables and produce them in mass numbers to be able to compete with big uh, companies around the world and also to be able to be up to, up to spec for what the retailers, uh, i.e. Tesco's, Super Value, Dunsters, what they want to need um, um, in terms of vegetable production because they have to, they, have, they, they often give cheap prices into, into those retailers. And what they prefer to do is go direct and be able to sell directly locally to people for, for, for a better price. Um, 
Anyway, so that's Country Crest. They've got economies of scale at this stage because they're producing loads and loads of vegetables with massive machinery and massive amounts of land. Um, and they're able to get their prices down uh, by doing that. Okay, so global brand uh, recognition is another benefit of going global. So in other words, your brand gets known around the world. Think of McDonald's, the M sign, known globally. Think of the Nike tick, think of... Uh, Coca-Cola, the red and, and white writing them uh, in, in, in the middle and the, the actual writing itself is, 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 is a symbol worldwide. Now. So business strength and survival. Um, so you're going to survive arguably better if people know your brand name and they know it's a brand name associated with quality and something that they really like. Um, okay, and then the risks then uh, for business operating globally are you might not be able to meet the customer's needs properly because you're um, you're trying to sell into different countries around the world. It's, it's not always easy. It can, it can be hard to, to, to manage. Obviously, the more variables involved and the more languages involved, the more, obviously, it's more complicated. Um, but having good people and good ICT systems can, can really help that. Um, diseconomies of scale, such as poor communications. So if you have poor ICT equipment or you've just so many different levels and layers of management. This ties back into our other chapter when we're doing organizational structures. So if you have a poor organizational structure where communication is getting lost because you're getting so big, that's, it's becoming very, very hard to manage and to communicate with your managers and your staff and your customers and your stakeholders. Um, obviously, that can be a disadvantage or risk. And then global scale risks. So what are they? They're the likes of uh, huge ones like uh, climate change coming down the tracks. So there's the COVID-19 uh, virus currently happening. That's affecting all economies um, around the world. Um, and that's a global risk. And that's a massive risk for these global com companies. And it's a massive risk for Ireland and its global companies because um, there's going to be a lot of countries that are going to suffer and not going to be buying uh, the products from those Irish companies are not going to be able to afford it. Um, they might have to scale back, in other words, reduce their employees, reduce their production in those countries, and reduce their sales in those countries out of uh, well, no choice because people uh, will uh, be losing jobs and people will, be, uh, will, will have less money to spend on their products. So um, those global risks are are happening now and also you'd have all sorts of global risks you the banking crisis not so long ago you have um, things like food crisis from time to time you've got uh, weather patterns that change food production for example that's a risk as well there's loads of global risks there's risks happening uh, globally all the time different pandemics different uh, problems and they impact on business globally okay and if you're a global company then obviously it's going to impact more on your type of company than if you're keeping more local Okay, so um, <clears throat> this slide here talks about um, Enterprise Ireland. And Enterprise Ireland is a fabulous organization in Ireland. Um, I use it myself, my own company, Montenegro.e. And um, it's, you know, it helps helped me in loads of ways. It helps you with your skills in terms of um, how to promote your business. It helps you web design, how to build your own website if you want. Um, It'll help you get into foreign markets if you want. It'll help give advice on those markets. It'll help give you market research that has already been done in those foreign markets to make it easier for you to trade in those foreign markets. Um, so market research is huge because that takes so much time and money and effort from people. It's great to have an organization that has done the work for you. Um, international promotion, they'll help you promote your, your brand internationally. Why? Because they want Irish companies to do well because that helps uh, create money and money creates jobs and taxes and it's all circular and it all makes Ireland uh, Inc. a more uh, profitable place for everyone. So they also help with uh, distribution chains so they might already know someone who knows someone and they've got links uh, within those countries who have uh, had successful links with Irish companies in the past and they'll say right you we'd recommend maybe using this dis distributor it's worked well for our other Irish uh, companies so they have experience and you can go to them and get advice on that translation services they'll help you translate and help you know maybe the ins and outs of local cultural needs uh, so obviously it's worth talking to them about that before you were to enter into the market they give you advice regulations now 
regulations is a tricky one because laws and regulations are not all the same around the world. They're similar within the EU because the, that's what the EU wants to make business and, e and trade easier. But if you go to other uh, countries outside the EU, their laws and their reg regulations and the way they do, want to do business might be very different to the way we do business uh, in Ireland and within the EU. So you need to get advice on that. They also have grants, so that's uh, free money that you don't have to pay back. And then they give venture capital. And what venture capital is, they uh, invest money in your business uh, with the hope that they're going to get a return on it. So we did in previous chapters that uh, when you invest in a company, you invest in equity. Um, so you take a share, you buy part of the com company, and then you get paid things called dividends, which is uh, maybe a monthly check in the post. If, you're, if your company is profitable, then you get payback from that company. And then if you want to sell on your shares in future, then hopefully the companies become bigger and you've made money and uh, Enterprise Ireland has made money on your company and they, they'd sell their shares maybe into the future. Okay, so moving on. Oh, that's it. Okay, so again, um, that ties up the, the unit seven. Um, I hope you've learned something and we were able to add a few key points into the slides that are there already. Um, again, if you have any questions, you have me online and um, please use that uh, services available to you. Um, let's look. Keep well. Bye bye. Welcome class. Uh, second years and first years can, can use this video. We're going to uh, go through the role of, of media. Um, it's chapter 10. I want to say thank you to a student of mine uh, who made this video and I updated and ad added different slides to it. And I want to show you an example of the type of presentation that a student could do and send to me. Also want to thank students who have sent me some fabulous presentations. So well done on that. Right to begin, the contents then of what we're going to talk about in this video. Again, this video is from Strand Tree. It's called The Role of Media. You'll find it in your book at the end, um, After Law. I'll also put up a link on my website, mrmagari.weebly.com, so you can get access to the full uh, presentation also. Media. We're going to talk about media. We're going to talk about public opinion. We're going to talk about the evolving media. We're going to talk about digital citizenship and also the digital print that we leave behind on the internet. Uh, we're going to talk about media in, the, in, in democracy how it can influence uh, democracies and different people getting into power. We'll use examples such as America and Ireland. We'll also talk about bias, fake news and alternative facts. Media. Media is a, is a, is a great way of communicating and receiving information such as news through different mediums. Different types of mediums are newspapers, we can get our information and our news from newspapers, posters, leaflets, TV, and on loads of different platforms, um, especially nowadays on social media. And the easiest way to remember social media is Facebook or Snapchat for students, but I'll take you through a few other options right there as well. Public opinion. Editors decide the stories that they want to tell people and what point of view to take them. So they'll have their own bias, they'll have their own ideas, newspaper editors included. Um, and also people writing stuff on the internet will have a bias. They'll have um, certain likes and dislikes themselves. That will be hard to write an article without bringing in their own perspective on it. Advertising is a huge part of newspapers and TV programs. And they make a lot of money from advertisement. For example, the Irish Times, you can, um, businesses can buy a, a 
page ad in the, in the Irish Times for approximately 60,000 euro for a full page. So that gives an example of how the media makes money. Having said that, newspapers are starting to lose money at the moment and social media such as Twitter, Google, Facebook, etc., are reaping all the profits as people move and switch more to social media for the news, which in my opinion is wrong. I continue to buy the Sunday Independent and the Irish Times on Saturday the weekend there. And I find that particularly to be a great read and the stories and the, and the, the, the level of writing quality in it is, is, is really high. So it's a great overall education. I know when we're young, we look at different stories, different things. That's fine. Just to know that uh, there's, there's better quality news out there that can be accessed. Okay, moving on. The development of media. Media has evolved greatly in the last few years with the introduction of e-books, that are books that you can read online. You've got streamed music now. Think of Amazon, the biggest company in the world, probably at this stage, biggest market capitalization, which means the biggest wealth behind it, and one of the biggest growing companies in the world. So a lot of people are, are even now with COVID-19 buying music books on Amazon and loads of various different products and are constantly hitting people with messages and emails um, to sell them stuff. Okay, and then they'll put little ads here, there, and everywhere. So everyone at this stage knows the brand name Amazon. Um, and I'm <laughs> probably not helping um, Irish, Irish uh, companies' causes by mentioning names. So what we, should, what we should really be trying to do, especially in these times, is to buy local and buy Irish, um, even if it costs a little bit more. It doesn't always, but even if it costs a little bit more, it helps to keep and keep keeps jobs and taxes and everything in our country. Right, so e.g. Instagram and LinkedIn, for the older generations, um, adults working in the business world, a lot of them will use Instagram and LinkedIn and they see them as more professional to use rather than Facebook and Snapchat. A lot of adults wouldn't use Snapchat. Okay, so moving on. Digital citizenship. Media has evolved greatly to allow us to communicate to those who, are, who we, we are unable to talk to face to face no matter where they are. So you know I'm using um, Zoom at the moment. So we've had a lot of our teaching meetings using Zoom with 80 or more teachers on the screen. Um, you flick through the screens, you can see people, hear people. Uh, it's a fantastic medium, especially during these times. Um, but there's advantages and disadvantages. So we'll talk more about how face-to-face um, -face time is very important for personal relationships and, and building friendships and, and, and building relationships rather than uh, spending too much time on screen time. Okay. So Donald Trump um, is the guy on the right. He, as you know from class, he's the president of America. Um, you also probably know who the president before him was. I'll give you a moment to think and guess who that was. You did mention class. Yeah, okay, Barack Obama. Okay, so Barack Obama's from the Democrats and Donald Trump is more from the Republican Party. And he um, uses Twitter to bypass the TV stations and reporters a lot. In fact, the reporters annoy him to no end and he calls everything that a lot of what they're saying um, biased news and fake news and he's kind of famous for coining, coining the, the phrase of fake news um, and yet there's arguments for and against because yet there is a lot of fake news out there um, whether he whether Donald Trump what he's putting up on on Twitter is fake or 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 or, or real um, you know um, has to be considered as well and everything has to be considered. Every person who's putting up news, every writer, every editor, every piece of social uh, media that goes up, we need to analyze it with a critical eye to see where it's coming from, who sent it, um, what bias is attached, and various other elements. Okay, politicians now use media in their campaigns to reach people and influence their votes. Take Leo Vradkar, he's got a huge uh, Twitter following. Um, Donald Trump there has one of the biggest Twitter followings in the world. I think it could be up to close to a billion, don't quote me on that, but uh, 
he's got a lot of followers at the moment, people interested to hear what he, what he has to say. Some because people think it's funny and others because they think it's interesting and he's some great support. And then he's some people who ridicule him. Okay, so Leo Varadkar and Donald Trump have a huge list of Twitter followers. They like to get their messages out to the world using Twitter. Um, it's one of the number of means. Trump doesn't trust the American media and first to send his messages directly from his office. So whether he types the actual message himself, we don't know, he might, uh, or maybe he's busy and he gets his office or maybe tells someone else to, to write it up, etc. cetera. So um, yeah, just to consider that as well. Same with Leo Vradkar, he might have an office or a civil service might be writing his messages for him or he might write in person. We don't know for sure. Okay, so bias, fake news and alternative news. Uh, a big worry for me as a teacher is YouTube. A lot of students are getting their information from YouTube and uh, you know, you need to be very careful YouTube if they're teaching you about important topics. You know, you're trying to, you're looking up something about, I don't know, health or, or, or um, something that you're interested in. The next thing this person, this guy or woman is up talking about telling you why it's good or why it's bad or, or various things. Be very careful with that because a lot of those people aren't doctors, not qualified. They may or may not have the education to be talking about what they're talking about to, to young children. So again, it, it falls back on checking your sources, uh, making sure the person is an expert, expert properly qualified. Um, it's very hard to very verify that. So that's why it's always good to go through your parents and pass, train, pass things by your parents to see if it's legitimate what you're reading or, 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 or listening to, or if it's... Uh, if it's just someone uh, coming up with uh, opinions himself or herself. Okay, so a few uh, tips here. Have you checked the source? So have you checked where it's coming from, where the information is coming from? So you need to investigate the site, what's its purpose and its contact information. So uh, part of the, the source uh, and the reason why some of those people have YouTube videos up on different social media accounts is they make money from the advertising. So even though it might be factual, and they may or, not, may or may not be telling you uh, relevant or truthful information. They, they'll still make money from advertising if it's popular and, and people just like listening to that person. Okay, so have you checked the order? Do a quick online search on the order. Is he or she a reasonable person? Is this person reliable? Is it reliable information? Is the person reliable? So if they're talking about health matters, it should be a qualified doctor. If they're talking about something to do with the virus, it should be a proper qualified person. Um, we specialize in viruses, like the good people we have on RT News at the moment. And that's part of the reason why we use the RT, RT News app in class, because you get reliable, good information, um, accurate information, and it's government backed. Yeah. Um, Word of caution there is not to spend too much time on, on depressing or bad news stories. Try and focus more on the, on the positive ones, especially when you're, when you're off during this period. Um, there's plenty of stories there. You don't have to focus on the, on, on virus stories or, or bad stories. Um, okay, right, moving on. Have you checked the date when the story was posted? Old stories are not necessarily relevant to current events. What are, the, what are your, your opinions? Are you biased? Could your own judgments uh, and beliefs be affecting your judgment? Okay, so your own beliefs and judgments can, ha can make you form beliefs and ideas about things as well. Have you read the whole story or have you just taken snippets of information from the story or has the person sending the information just been very selective and not given the full story and just given uh, part of the story? Something that caught my attention in the news recently was the Green Party. Um, when they're on the news, uh, there seems to be snippets in the news, but I'm right or wrong. This is just a, an opinion. But um, they, the news seems to be not given the full story of what the, what the Green Party are, are for, but they're, they're highlighting issues that might turn the public against them. So they're highlighting things like, it's going to cost, the, the Green Party going to cost uh, Ireland uh, billions in euro uh, to get their climate strategies in, in check, that they're you know, holding farmers and car owners, et cetera, to ransom. Which is not, not, not fully true. It's not looking at the whole picture. For the whole picture, you might have to go direct, say, to a political party's website. Um, and again, this is not just about the Green Party, it could be about Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil, 
Sinn Féin, it could be about Social Democrats, Labour Party. They all uh, mightn't get their full story told. Um, yeah, and so it's important to maybe go directly to their websites to see what, what their, their head office is actually saying. What are their policies? What are their plans? And what do they intend to do? Okay. Does it have supporting source sources? So it has your information that you found, has it got uh, supporting uh, sources? Click on any further links. Does the information and the other links support the story that you're reading? Is it a joke? If it's ridiculous, it might be a joke. Find out more about uh, the author on the site. You'll see a joke later on, uh, a picture of a, uh, a basketball, you know, massive basketball on the Nace Road that, that, that supposedly has fallen onto the Nace Road Road. You'll see it later, I'll explain that later. Have you asked the experts? Ask someone you trust or, or consult uh, to fact check the website. So again, your parents are your first port of call. Uh, your teachers are a good way as well to, to, to ask and, and find out is that fake news or is that uh, an accurate source of information to be reading. Okay, here's the, uh, the joke uh, visual that someone had created on a computer so anytime you're driving down Nace Road, you'll see this massive big basketball to represent the, the, our national basketball stadium. And look what they've done. They've managed on a computer to make it look like the ball, the basketball's uh, monument has fallen down, broken a, a sign, is going to crash into people uh, on the road, right? So um, people do that, you know, for fun and, and for the crack sometimes, but... Um, Obviously, the other side of that is if people start believing that story, you're, you're affecting the guardian emergency services having to be called, and they could be called out to other more important part, matters of some of the serious disease or serious health issues. And they're now thinking that this is about to happen on that road, and, and they're mobilize, mobilizing the resources to try and help. So um, it's very realistic. It's, it's a good example to show you how, real, how realistic uh, writers and authors and, and people using cameras and videos and, and editing software can make something look. So this is a fake story made to look very real using edited, edited visuals and text. Source of information. So I'm showing you this because I want students to write down where, what websites and links they got their information from. Again, it ties into um, what we're talking about uh, in terms of, of, of bias, fake, and where we get our information from. And we've been um, recommending this for all our presentations that students write down where to get your information from. And we were recommending in class, rather than using google.com, to maybe try and use googlescholar.com. Yeah, which is there in the second one. And as you see, this student has written down some of the, uh, the links that it used to find its information. Yeah, so that's handy. And then the teacher can see, is it good information there? accessing or is it uh, maybe from websites that aren't going to be helpful to a student. Moving on. Conclusion then. The role of media. So we've talked about the role of media in our lives. Um, it has a, just to sum up on that, it has a, a massive impact on our lives because we're, we're hearing and listening and reading things all the time um, on our phones. Yeah, and we need to be careful not to spend too much time on phones and playstations and screen time. Uh, we need to be out maybe an exercise and, and take on a new challenge, learn a new instrument maybe, take on a new adventure, go for a walk. Um, yeah, there's loads of things we can do. But uh, spending too long on, on phones uh, kind of dominates our lives then. Yeah, and watching news all the time isn't healthy either. Uh, recommended for the RT News app, but we recommend just every second night, maybe five, 10 minutes, have a look and, and see what's going on. And don't focus on all the negative stories. Okay, so it affects public opinion. So depending on what media and what, what news comes out, the public might decide, oh, let's vote for Fianna Fáil or let's vote for uh, the Labour Party, um, you know, during that general election. So the media there in a democracy is very important because it can influence people's vote. How media has changed. So it's changed from print, newspapers, and then we TV, satellite TV, and we now have an increase in social media, e.g. Twitter, Snapchat, 
Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, websites, blogs, um, podcasts. And there's probably more that I've forgotten, but there's a good few to keep you going anyway. Okay, digital med digital citizenship and digital uh, footprint, e.g. private information or visuals. So it's very important to be aware that um, when we're online, um, top companies can track where we've been, what we've seen, and they can tailor their advertisements to to our particular likes and dislikes, particularly for our likes. So they can sell us stuff based on what we've clicked on. You can also see things, and there's very little private nowadays online. Um, some people argue that the, even the webcams are, are that big companies um, around the world can access our webcams, can access our audio to our TVs and to our laptops and to our, to our phones. And it's just be aware that if we want something private, need to close down our laptops, uh, switch off the phones, um, turn off the TVs. Yeah, okay. Media in democracy. And we spoke about how it influenced, it helped Twitter and, and the social media campaign. In other words, the amount of messages that Barack Obama sent out. He was using a lot of social media and he got into power as president, the first black president of America. And social media had a massive impact then on getting him elected. And it's the same with Twitter, Twitter and Trump that's having a massive uh, influence on, on the public, what they think of Trump um, and his influence over America and the world. And to a lesser extent, because we're a smaller country, Leo Bradker and, and his Twitter account. And people pick up messages from that and, and, and have a think about uh, what way Ireland's going and what, what way maybe it's been wrong. Bias, fake news, and alternative facts, e.g. YouTube, Snapchat, Snapchat, TikTok, I heard is a, another new one for, for students. I haven't seen it, don't know much about it. I've heard about Snapchat, all right, and I definitely know about YouTube. So, yeah, you get a lot of bias, fake news, and alternative facts and pictures that mightn't be true, mightn't be accurate, um, so just be aware of that and be vigilant. So on reflection, through this project, um, right, we learned about how the media needs to be checked if it's accurate or not, how public opinion can be positive or negative, and the media um, definitely influences a lot. The evolving media and how it's changing from um, news on print, such as newspapers, to TV, and now more and more on our social media platforms, such as F Facebook, Twitter, Google, and all the rest of them. And then we've, we talked about digital citizenship and we talked about media and democracy, what's fair and what's the truth, yeah, and how it influences people getting into power around the world, different uh, media and how it's used and who it's run by and who has power control over it. Bias, fake news and alternative facts, be aware. He said, yeah, YouTube, and Snapchat, um, TikTok, just be aware of visuals, be aware of what's being said, and don't always take it at face value, and don't always take things to be the truth. Um, if in doubt, show an adult, um, your parents or teacher, obviously being your for first port of call. And see the link on the last page for an interesting video on the role of media. Oh yeah, I put this uh, link together for you. I think it's set up so you can uh, click on it this one here it's at the very end um, and you'd be able to see an interesting video there in the role of media just if you get sick of listening to me if someone else is listening there for I think it's only five to ten minutes but it's good check it out okay so 